On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nana Poku, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Fatwani Nixwell Madal. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Madal. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. Inaugural lectures present an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic's career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. These lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contribution to their field, of their field to academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. I would like to acknowledge the following guests, members of the executive management, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Fatwani Nixwell Madal, family and friends of Professor Madal, academics and professional staff, students, alumni, and distinguished guests. It is now my pleasure to now formally introduce the inaugurant, Professor Fatwani Nixwell Madal. Professor Madal is a professor and dean and head of school at the University of KwaZulu Natal. He completed a BSc Agric in crop science at the University of Venda in 1996, and then registered for an MSc at the University of Stellenbosch, where he researched citrus nutrition. He completed his PhD in horticultural sciences at the University of Pretoria in 2005, and has done extensive research in herbal medicine. He has completed a master's in business leadership at Janisa Graduate School of Business Leadership, and attended a number of leadership courses at Gibbs and UCT Graduate School of Business. His previous working experience includes Vista University Vudek campus, now incorporated into University of South Africa, University of Venda, and University of Limpopo as a lecturer. In 2006, he was seconded to establish a fully funded research center as an associate professor and center manager known as Limpopo Agrofood Technology Station by Shumasano Trust, now Technology Innovation Agency, TIA. He then joined Industrial Development Corporation under Food and Beverages, now Agro Industries, Strategic Business Unit in Healthcare and Education as a specialist. He has extensively published more than 100 papers in both local and international journals and received numerous funding for research from various funders. His H index is 24 on Google Scholar, 15 on Scopus, and 12 on the Web of Science. And his work has been cited 1,437 times according to Google Scholar. He has supervised 48 Master of Science and Master of Agricultural students and 11 PhD students. He currently supervises eight PhD students whom he was supervising before he joined UKZN in 2020 in the field of plant sciences. He has briefly served as a board member of the South African Horticultural Sciences Society, Rotondo Propriety Limited, Bereka Sanang, a subsidiaries company and the Industrial Development Corporation, and has received a reviewed a number of manuscripts in highly reputed journals, both locally and internationally, and has vast experience in project development and implementation in agro industries, education, and the healthcare sector. He has extensive experience in managing mega projects, performing initial assessments on business proposals, due diligence investigations, as well as presentation of written recommendations to credit investment committees and investors. These skills are not common in most scientists. He has served on the selection committee for the best published papers in the American Society of Horticultural Journal under the American Horticultural Science Society for a full term. He is a C3 NRF rated scientist with numerous awards, including the UNISA Research Chancellor Award, Best Publisher under GDAD Research Grant in five consecutive years, and was one of the finalists of the NSTF Awards under Crop Science Category and Research Output. I now invite Professor Madal 
to deliver his inaugural lecture. Professor Madao, over to you. Thanks so, thanks so much, uh, uh, Professor Ney, um, Konali, for such an introduction. I'm gonna be talking about disabilities as a strategy focus area for the National Industrial Policy Framework, potential prospects for future industrialization. In South Africa, um, we are endowed uh, with a lot of herbalties, some of them that are already in the market, like honey bush tea and rooibos. in that, those marginal areas in the Western Cape. As a result of this, there's still more opportunities of herbal teas that can still need to explore. Lots of work for almost 16 years now. And it's, it's a, such a wonderful crop that I enjoyed working in that particular crop for a very long time. You will realize that particularly when you're working in the new um, or, or underutilized crops, they've got heritage in those particular areas where they exist. If I had time, I would talk about the history of poppies, which now you use them for panado or for pen killing, killers. And also hypoxis, which some other people use it for other things. But in most instances, quite often than not, you find out that these crops, when you started working on them, depending on the areas where they were, we are working on, they actually even a theft in that particular area, depending on what they want to use it for. I've previously, previously worked on hypoxis and we planted it in the farm at the experimental farm. And it happened that the plants were stolen within one night. Now, what is this? Um, it, it's a policy which was developed a long time ago with the uh, Department of Trade Industry. And then it was later on overtaken by New Growth Pass and now NDP. But however, all these policies that the government has initiated, all of them are aligned to such an extent that they lead in one common goal. Now, this, this, this aspect of the industry policy framework, what they do, they in actual fact, uh, bring the diversifications beyond the economic reliance and uh, in, in terms of the traditional commodities and non-tradable aspects of all these crops that require, actually require the, the, the create a new industry, which is labor intensive and ways on how we can actually build up the industry, particularly in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the marginal areas and also in the areas where the poverty is prevailing in those areas. in those particular areas, Please unmute, Prof. I presume I'm still sharing. Right.
Right. I was still talking about this plant. Pamela, can you hear me? I'm still audible. We can hear you, Fatu. Yes, Pra. I'm just worried because this thing's just moving around. Um, I was in the case saying that there are nine subspecies that are distributed in South Africa. And the leaves of this particular plant um, are, um, are alternate linear to broadly lanceolate, tapering to a shape point. And the inflorescence head of the bush tea is sessil and subsessil and terminates axillary in a large sub such cricomes panicles. I will later on talk about these flowers that you can be able to see over here. There's something that we're trying to look into that with the School of Health Sciences and Laboratories and on how we can be able to exploit flowers without even losing anything around it. Now, the bush tea is a natural fact uh, found in, in Lipopo areas in Pumalanga and Kazuna Tal and also some parts of Eastern Cape. But how, however, something in, interestingly, in, Lip, in, in, in Kazuna Natal is actually predominant uh, in these areas to such an extent that based on the fact that I'm around KZN currently, that is that's something that we need to start looking into that. I was earlier on saying, and uh, talking to the colleagues here before we start, saying that once you are driving around old Howick Road, you can actually even find some bush trees now, which are starting to mushrooms after felt fires. Now, what are the medicinal benefits of this bush tea? Bush tea is used for treatment of boils, acne infested wounds, headaches, cold and loss of voices and throat infection. And traditional treatments is also being used for hypertension, heart diseases and diabetes and soaked extract used as ethmaltics. And in other areas, they was also use as aphrodisiac resins. Now, quite often, if I mentioned about this word, about aphrodisiac aspects, a lot of people are becoming so excited about it and they try to ask me, what does it work? And I, the simple answer that I say this in indigenous knowledge system knowledge, I don't actually even know the mode of actions in terms of all these medicinal benefits traditionally that are used for. Now, let me just give you a little bit of a back of, of biochemistry of tea as a build up of some of the theoretical aspects that we know. Now, the tea is classified within the TCFE family. We've got black teas, wallow, green teas, wallow teas, and other many teas that are coming from TCFE family. Now, traditional tea, politics generally, anything that is not coming from Camellia or TCFE family is not actually tea. Now, a lot of people ask me, why about this bush tea that I'm going to talk about now? I said, no, this tea, whether it's not tea because it belongs to a stressy family, and of, you know, of the view that it does not belong to the Thiasi family, the tea is drinkable. So what are the quality, in, quality indicators that actually build up all these aspects? There are amino acids, carbohydrates, organic acid, vitamins, the volatile flavor compounds, plant pigments, and we also use as a sensory attributes, quality attributes, which are generally astringents in taste, bitterness, sweetness, and aroma. Now, in other studies, which I will actually indicate over there of what we have done in a normal uh, bush tea, we actually even found out there has been a very strong correlation between the sensory quality attributes and chemical compounds that are found. Now, the phenolic acid versus catechins. There are a number of catechins which are initially found in taste. There's like normal catechins, gallocatechins, epicatechin, catechins, and epigallocatechins. Now, colleagues, don't be, don't, don't, don't be confused about all these compounds that I'm talking over here. We don't drink compounds, we drink tea. So therefore, you should not worry about what I'm talking about here. I will try to make sure that at least I bring it down to such an extent that all of us will understand as we go here. Now, these phenolic compounds, generally they are chemical compounds just for defense against either birds, insects, or animals, which would consume plant as food. But however, this green tea is made up without enzymatic oxidations of polyphenols, oxidized by polyphenol and, and peroxidase. And generally these enzymes, they're also used for browning aspects of it. Now, in a broader sense, the green tea phenols consists of this simple and simple and complex compounds, which are large majorities, of which the fl flavor noise monomers and catechins and catechins galate and flavon triol are all these flavor noise. But however, the catechins itself, it can also be oxidized to form a compound to compounds which are called theoropigins and theoflavins. Now, 
These compounds, they also contribute in terms of making quality aspects of that. Now, they are derived from the, all these Camellia sinensis, which I was talking about, a shrub which is generally native in China and India, and which is constitute um, co and contains a, a unique antioxidant called flavonoids. Like I actually indica indicated earlier on about the epicatechins gallant, which also have as a free radicals that can contribute to cancer, heart diseases, and clog arteries. And all these teas have, have caffeines and theanines, which generally affect brains and heightens metal alertedness. In green teas, they've got high concentrations of epicatechins gallant, which are widely studied in number of teas. And these green tea antioxidants may interfere with your growth of your bladder, breasts, lung, stomach, pancreatics, and collateral cancer diseases. Therefore, drinking tea is very useful. Now, the other health benefits of normal tea is they prevent even in terms of clog clogging your arteries. They also burn your fats. They counteract antioxidant stress on the brains and reduce risk of neurological disorders and, and, and reduces risk of stroke and improve cholesterol levels. Different studies have shown, have exhibited that black tea may protect your lung from damage caused by exposure of cigarette smoke. I'm not saying that people should go smoke. It may also reduce such kind of risk of stroke. The white teas, which is also comes up basically by processing techniques. It also has a potent anti-cancer properties compared to most of the processed teas. In the oolong teas, they've got lower bad cholesterols, the LDLs, and one variety of this oolong in oil heavily marketed weight loss supplements, but science does not have any backups in terms of some of the claims particularly the weight loss gain. And, and I know that a lot of people that are into this space because everybody wants to re reduce weight and live longer. And, and these are some of the aspects that this tea does in terms of reducing the low density lipid, which are called bad cholesterols. Now, I'm gonna talk about bush tea going throughout. And I'll share the research which has been done for the last 16 years, but I'll give you the glimpse of one of the major highlights Overall, because if I talk about this, we might talk here about the whole day. Now, this tea, we discovered that there's not any detectable caffeine content present in Anthracia phylloides or bush tea when we use the TLCs and HPL spray reagents. And neither screen use using spectrophotometry aspects of, of that and, and GC. We analyzed that there was no any evidence of showing this paralytoxins alkaloid in bush tea. Now, this alkaloid is seen as a very dangerous alcohol alkaloid. That Doctor, we you're not sharing your screen, sorry. Um, are, you not, are you not seeing my screen? No, we're not seeing your screen. Uh, can you see it now? I'm sorry about that, that I yes, moved along. Yes, yes, you can see it now, thanks. But quite long when I was not talking, showing my, my, my screen. Neil, that proves that I can talk about this um, for a long time without actually even sharing screens. But that's not good for this sake of this presentation. I think now you can be able to see. Yes, you can now, thank you. All right. I was talking about these paradoxins, alkalines in bush tea, that the first target that if is there, it targets your liver. And once it targets your liver, then you are in trouble. So these alkaloids is not there in bush tea. Now, what does it mean that bush tea now is a healthy alternative to caffeine containing beverages? Those are some of the examples of the, of, of the, of the, of the pictures of bush tea, which was cult cultivated under normal cultivation. Now, what does bush tea constitute of what something that we have discovered over years? We actually find out that bush tea contain antioxidant activities. Bush tea is anti-diabetic, anti is anti-cancerous, anti-stress, and anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial. A number of crops has been also been investigated these aspects of it, but it, overall, in spite of everything that I can talk about, these are critical components that bush tea has. 
Now, in this bush tea, we try to isolate a compound out of it using NMR spectroscopic measurements. And we actually found out that bush tea, bush tea leaves possesses this five hydroxy six, seven, eight, three, four, five hexamethosetriol as a major flavor noise in bush tea. Now, these flavonoids, this is a compound of it. It was discovered from the bush tea in any crop, in any plant all over the world. It was characterized in this form for the first time. This was a major exciting discovery and I did that when I was doing my PhD. And with Emmanuel and other colleagues, we tested that this compound has antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory and antioxidants in nature. And therefore that repeated bush tea as a healthy crop that we can actually even exploit going forward. Now, this, this plant, in actual fact, when we discovered this compound, we had harvested uh, these plant materials from the wine and it's not generally not sustainable. What we did now, we started getting ways on how we can propagate this plant. How did we propagate that? We used just a normal simple ceratix and we raised the plant, the plant and then after we harvested the plant. Now, the question that a lot of people ask, once you do that, does this compound exist? Yes, it's true, it still, it still exists. So therefore, you can propagate, you can harvest from the white, which is not sustainable. However, Biodiversity Act is against that, but these are some of the propagation techniques that we actually found out that you can be able to do that. When we planted this, we found out that the yields build, build up they are still sustainable to such an extent that you can be able to achieve ex sustainable yields. Now, when I'm talking about these yields, yields are very critical in the sense that all the investors, they work anything about their costing of your sales based on the yields that you attain. In that respect, we can be able to maximize yields between close to eight to 15 tons per hectare. And therefore, we can be able to do that because you don't want to have a raw materials or economic of scale risk. So the idea of measuring those particular yields without compromising quality, that was the idea that we're trying to do that. Now, when you are building up in terms of cultivation practices, there's this theory of carbon balanced nitrogen hypothesis, which postulates the carbon neutral status of the plants is determined by this resource availability and to determine the control of the allocations of these metabolites. Now, what we actually found out that this carbon nitrogen balance hypothesis was originally formulated to predict the concentration of these secondary metabolites on the basis of the changes of the production of metabolites. Now, you're gonna cultivate that. This theory, we actually found that it was not plausible as generally accepted. And I think the botanist, I'm talking about the pure botanist, they were against such kind of things in the sense that this is a theory that has been researched over 100 years, but in a cultural perspective or agronomic or cultural practices, you're still gonna plant this. When you plant, you need to fertilize all these plants. And this is one of the second work that we actually did out of my PhDs. We published in the Regional Botany. We found out that this, these findings contradicted with the, that carbon nutrients balance hypothesis, which conclude that the theory is not generally accepted generally because in a crusher perspective, you need to improve your years build up. Now we actually even did some pruning work. We actually now we know that if you harvest it from the shoot, it sprouts. And we did that with Maudi, my master student. And we also did metabolic studies, which I will also show even one of the results. However, we also did even nematode studies. I cannot claim that I'm a nematologist. Otherwise, Professor Michelle will, be, will fight me. Now, in this bush tea, we did some work with Dian Guga, who finished his master's in 2020. We actually found out that in this bush tea, it can also be attacked by Melorogan incognita, Javanica and Hapla, and Interolobi. Those are the nematodes which generally attack these plants, actually even from the wine. Now, we are planting the plant, we are fertilizing, we didn't know what was the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that we can actually even apply. We actually even know what are the micro elements that we have to apply. Now, the deal makers, they will also ask about all these aspects or about your inputs. But we found out that we found out that 300 kg nitrogen and phosphorus, which is pertained to be so high, and potassium, and we scale down, we actually find that in actual, they also improve yields, 
without even compromising the phenols and, 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 and the foliar application sprays. We actually also found out if we apply foliarly on a zinc, iron, copper, and boron at 100 milliliter per liter, it actually even improves some of the compounds which are actually there in the bush tea. Now, I said that we did some metabolomic studies. Don't be confused with those people who are not even biochemist, chem chemist, or in the chemistry. But the idea of doing such kind of studies, we wanted to profile that once you plant it over years, what actually happened in, in terms of the summer, uh, spring, winter, and autumn? What we found out from these studies in spring and summer, this were the time that you can be able to optimize more yields as compared to autumn and winter. The reason being that the plant become dormant, but when it becomes dormant, in other studies we found that the carbon, the carbon rate shoots up and the phenols shoots up and all other compounds also shoot up. But you need to maximize that so that at least you don't actually even risk your economic of scales. Now, I said earlier on that we did studies around sensory analysis characteristics and also volatile flavor compounds. We actually found that there was a very clear chemical correlations between the two. So therefore, you harvest bush tea, you did sensory studies without even looking, looking into co volatile compounds. We actually even found out that you can actually even have a good taste with no astrogens. Therefore, it exhibits that the tea is drinkable. So those are some of the examples that I was talking about, about metabolic, metabolic on, a, on a chemical differences on bush tea on seasonal dynamics, and that we actually even optimize that. We're using NMR and LCMS in these studies. Now, we know now that we can cultivate this bush tea. This simple how you start actually even doing that. And these are the plants that you actually do that. And you raise them, you harden them, and thereafter you take to the plant. Now, we actually did a very interesting study. And this study, is the latest one which actually was published not so long in, in hot science. And we were doing the UV studies. We put the shade nets in terms of ameliorating of climate change. If you drive around Pumalang in some other areas, even in the Western Cape, you actually find out there are so many shade nets that, are, that the farmers actually are doing because of the climate change issues, heat, stress, and so on and so on that we actually have. Now, in this study, we actually found that the bush tea plants grow best when they're exposed to full sunlight, followed by the white shade net, and we exploited that in black net. And this is standard horticultural practice, which is generally being used off late, about 80% shading, which led to the accumulations of these chlorogenic acids. Now, it was such a very interesting study, which we found in actual fact, this paper was published and accepted when we submitted for review, it was, it, it was in actual fact accepted for the first time with no any corrections. Now, the, 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 we recommended that if we use the white shadedness and 80% light intensity, maybe the best microclimate tool to enhance this chlorogenic acid of bush tea. Now, we in actual fact found, found out that the microclimate also enhances, I'm still gonna talk about this, cafelquinic acids and cumaric acid and, and, and dicafelquinic acid and tricafelquinic acids. These were some of the major, major discoveries that we found out that immediately if you do that and you expose the extracts into that, we actually found out that all these hydrocinamic acids actually move on. Now, we also did even some molecular network type of studies of recently. When we're not specialists, we collaborated with good, good people from UJ. I'm hoping that Professor Madana is around here. That what is this molecular network in a simpler way? It's a tandem mass spec, data organizational approach that has been recently introduced into that, that discovery and metabolomics and also in met, 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 met medical fields that the chemistry of these molecules detect how, how this fragmented the MS, MS to, to in, in a gas phase. And the two related molecules are likely to display similar frag, fragments in ion spectra. Now, the molecular network, when we use this technique, we find out something very interesting. This red spot, we used to call it 533, is a dicafeyl glucarate, which is shown to be a fragment, fragmentation retardness into these hydrocinamic acid derivatives. 
Now, I'm going to talk about this because these are some of the areas that now we're trying to exploit. Now, what are these hydrodynamic acid do? It's a potential class of the compounds for the management of lipid metabolism and obesity, obesity display antioxidant activities, the anti the calogenase, the anti-inflammatory and antimicrobials, and hence even anti tyrosinase activities, as well as a UV protective effect. Therefore now, the extracts of this bush tea can be used in different aspects of that. Now, when we use this, therefore you are creating a wide range of industry that you can, you can also use for the medicinal purposes. You can also use for tea. You can also use for, for skin care. That's suggesting that this can, is an opportunity to create a new areas of industrialization in order to exploit aspects of the anti-aging, the anti-inflammatory agents in order to <coughs> preservatives that you can also build up and hyperpigmentations correcting ingredients. Therefore now it creates a wide space that bush tea can also be used in that initial industrial policy framework that I actually indi indi indicated, which can create a labor absorbing and intensive industries which is unique in marginal areas in, in South Africa in order to create new opportunities for poor people as well. Now, this glucaric acid that I spoke about is a, when we do undergo, for, when it goes through photoisomerization during post ultraviolet light exposure, it is evidence that it images some photoisomers. I'm gonna talk about them at a later stage that when all these aspects, you can see, I know that you might not even understand this, but what it means that, that hydrodynamics, once we actually even expose them into a UV, natural one, those new aspects that actually comes in. But now in simply English, what I'm talking about, about all these aspects that I was talking about earlier on, in simply English, it actually means that the presence of these major compounds, diacyl and triacyl hydrodynamic derivatives attached to glucaric acid, it was characterized for the first time in bush tea and the presence of this structural diverse hydrostatic metabolites in bush tea is a critical factor in mitigating this photooxidative damage. Now, these compounds was discovered to undergo geometrical isomerizations upon UV exposure resulting in a structural diverse of cis isomers. These are some of the areas that we're trying to look into that. As a result, the more glucaric acid conjugates produce cis geometrical isomers than the quinic acid der derivatives. I think Manea will pardon me here. I'm presenting some of the results that currently are under review. We're waiting for the final acceptance of the new scripts, but I felt like some of the new discoveries around bush tea, let me share them. Now, I said earlier on that we should not be confused about all these compounds that I'm talking about here, colleagues. The potential of these clocks, I'm repeating this, is a management of lipid metabolism and obesity, display antioxidants in nature, anti-calogenase, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, anti, anti, anti activities that you can actually even use it in your lotion and so on and so on, as we are moving towards this industrial chain that I'm talking about that in terms of the hyperpigmentations. Nobody wants to bend by the sun and become too dark. And, and those are ones that is their choice, but we're trying to come up with ways on how we can be able to deal with that. Now in the market, now there are some extracts of the bush tea with now in the, of, of, of rooibos tea, which are already making oils and so on and so on, which are using, using that. And those industries are creating jobs. Now, science has to talk with the social aspects of what we have. Science has to talk with the science, talk to the scientific community, but science has to do something that eliminates social cohesion that we have as a country. And science has to create jobs. Now, <laughs> bush tea leaves, once we use them as a, as a zinc nanoparticles, we actually use, find out that the nanoparticles possesses several properties, such as microbial, anti-inflammatory, the wound healing, catalytic, and, and so on and so on, all other aspects. Among these, zinc oxide has received a copious considerations in a nano industry due to its technological and medicinal applications. Now, what we did here, we dope with bush tea leaf with with agents ACE induced in the formations of nanorods at high concentrations. And in this study, we actually found out that this is, 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 is natural plant 
extract of bush tea leaves can be used as a bioremediation of zinc nitrate hydrate to prepare a pure zinc oxide nanoparticles. We are not chemists, we are agronomists or culturists, but we're collaborative with nano team at the University of South Africa. They're suggesting that bush tea leaves can also be used in the nano producing industries. So therefore we are creating a wide range. The farmers can optimize, pack, make tea and use other things. They can put a plantations because the pack house for these things, they create more jobs. The development banks, they like to build pack house because pack house, they create more jobs. Therefore, we are creating a wide range of other opportunities that are quite very good that can be able to do that. Now, I said as a prospects of future industrializations, these are some of the aspects that I'm saying that bush tea, which is endemic in South Africa here, can actually even create a wide range of aspects that we can be able to enjoy uh, ourselves and we'll be able to deal with other social aspects that we have rather than to do science, we publish and perish and we're happy when we're not doing anything much about it. Now, what are the ongoing aspects that we are working on currently? Currently, there are water measurement studies that are in the field that are in the SEF there at UKZN. I said, talk, spoke about the bush tea flowers that we are doing anti-cancer activities with the School of Laboratory Sciences. Now we need to start looking into agro processing aspects. Now, the commercial preservatives, we're trying to, to use the already that they're dead on the market because you need to create an iced tea. Iced tea, you go to the shelf in pick and pay in any retail stores, you actually find that they're iced tea. So it's much easier to do that, that we can be able to create an iced tea for that. So these are some of the studies that are ongoing currently. We recently submitted even a proposal to Food and Beth. We hope that we'll be able to get that. We're doing even a spray drying on quality aspects on the health, health attributes or health benefits of bush tea. And we are looking into the storage and time that if you store it in the shelf, how long does it take? It will need a lot of microbial studies. So these are some of the current studies that some of my masters and PhDs are working on that <coughs> in glimpse. So we are of the few that once we be able to deal this, we'll be able to cover all the scope of some of the aspects that we still need to do. Now, out of this lecture, I spoke a lot of chemistry aspects of it, agronomic practices that we, we did that, but what is the take home message that you will say for today, what is that we're talking about? Simply, in simple English, the herbal bush tea can be used as a targeted sector within the national industrial policy framework as well as new growth paths in order to create more jobs. The commercial productions of bush tea leading to the establishment of the new beverage industry, medicinals and nano industry, which are some of the industries that will be bolstering what South Africa needs currently. The, the benefits, a unique benefits on the developmental aspects of this, it will be able to create new indigenous natural resources in order to create a new competitive space with a significant export potential. That is the take home message that we need to take. The potential of creating this in new industry, there's likelihood that you might even be able to get an offtake agreement with, in terms of your supplies with ease, but however also maximizing the yield risk or the production risk. So we know how we can be able to optimize that. We know how we can be able to do that. Therefore, it creates those opportunities that when you're answering for the investors that you can be able to do that. The competitive edge of this country is a unique product. It requires microclimate that we have in South Africa. It's not something that can just easily go to Australia. So therefore the plant is endemic around here. Therefore now we need to maximize that. Now, when I'm concluding here, I would like to acknowledge the following colleagues who assisted so much in these studies. Um, Professor Etienne Rabin and Karen Tron for having given me an, a background in terms of approaching science on a horticultural aspects on a citrus industry. Um, when I was doing my master's degree, Professor Saundi for initiating and, and Professor Jana Olifir for initiating this project at early stage in early 2000 and Professor Chow for laying a foundation for me and giving me confidence and opportunity as, as I'm building up my research career. Professor Mashela, you were a good colleague in Teflop. You gave me so much. 
to try to understand exactly of what is that we can be able to build going forward. And I'm so proud of you. To Rian Kuzi and Zora Matikizela from IDC, you gave me a dimensions of trying to balance science, business, and industry. And I thank you so much. I know that you didn't, don't even, you didn't even know that I'm talking about this today. And I truly appreciate all the skills, starting to, to do a basic accounting, marketing report and technical reports. Those are some of the things that actually built me that when I do science, I don't just do science for the sake of excitement and publishing. It makes me in order to converge into the industry of what the industry wants. The National Research Foundations and Health and Department of Agriculture, Chimisano Trust, now which is TIA Innovation Agency, UNISA, University of Lipop and UNIVEN, you gave me an opportunity to create an ecosystem around bush tea research. Now I'm known for it. And I thank you so much for funding the project. To the Agriculture, Ag Agriculture Science Society for the University of Enda and SASCO at UNIVEN and SUKA, we truly appreciate the breeding of the leadership skills that you gave us. And now we stand on our own with pride and dignity about you. To all my postgraduate students, I truly appreciate all the efforts that you have done to me to make me good and shine today. I would like to dedicate this uh, le today's lecture. I know that I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit on time uh, to appreciate my late wife, Nibu, that you gave me a space to operate and my two kids, Wutawe and, and, and Mtondwa, for giving me an opportunity for me to focus into this research in the last 16 years. And I'm so proud of you as a family. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Madao, for that wonderful talk and for taking us into the wonderful world of bush tea. I've noticed some interesting aromatic organic compounds in your presentation, so it was very, very enlightening for me. I see the collaboration between scientists and community is very important, and the differences that you may find in your secondary uh, metabolites might be very interesting for the community to take note of during different seasons. Uh, cultivating our own medicinal plants is definitely an important area of research in South Africa. And I think that secondary metabolites are going to be the future of medicines uh, in the world uh, in time to come. So, so thank you once again for that very interesting talk. And it just remains for me now to pass the vote of thanks. Um, I want to thank the members of the executive committee and distinguished guests for attending today's inaugural lecture to members of Prof. Madao's family who's attending, thank you very, very much. And to all our industry partners and government partners that have attended today's talk, a big thank you as well. And thank you to the audience for, today, for attending today's inaugural lecture. I now declare the proceedings closed. Uh, have a good evening, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>